It's the, I'll continue what I talked on yesterday and I'll go to secondary structure next week. Um, so, as I think I already mentioned, there is a, if you want to have more information that's a single sequence, you can use a family sequence together. Because we know that from evolution, of course, most genes are, are evolved by some kind of duplication, either by speciation or by duplicated them. So most genes have a common ancestor. And if you put all these genes that have a common ancestor together, you can start the family of this uh, set of sequences. And if you do that, first, you can use this information in many different ways. It's much more informative. So I will talk a bit about how to obtain multiple sequence elements and also how you use them. So they're not only, they are useful for a lot of prediction purposes. You can predict structure from it. They're useful also for detecting more homologs. So if you search, you make a family, you find things, then you can go on and search for others also. And that is actually much more powerful than using a single sequence. So, you can find, so in this list that I had before, we had all these proteins that were unrelated. If you use one of these methods, you can make a profile or hit a marker model. We can uh, certainly much more accurately find that these all are most likely homologs. So, but of course, the first step actually we need to have multiple sequence alignment. And by, I mean, it's not that difficult intuitively is basically we have one sequence that is line maybe like that, and maybe have some gaps, and then you have a third sequence that is maybe a line like that. So you have you have in each position here you have three characters or four or five or six or seven or ten thousand. Problem is that if you want to do this uh, so look optimally, I mean, you can calculate the scores, you can basically pa calculate every pass of scores here, so you have a sum of both alignments. The problem is to do this, you end up to 2 to the n to 1 pairwise alignments. Suppose so n is not the number of sequences, so even if n is 10, that's 1000 times slower than on, so even if 100 gets completely unfeasible. So 100 is 1 million times slower. And of course, today we have families with tens of thousands of members. So you can't, the optimal solution is difficult to obtain. Uh, so there are a number of different methods here that has been developed during the years that are much faster than to calculate these optimal alignments. While there are methods with optimal alignment, but nobody uses them. And uh, I will go through, I think, a little bit, not, not in detail, but hinting at how this works. And also, in particular, I will go through PsyBlast, which is not really a multiple sequence alignment method, but it's, it, it makes a multiple sequence alignment. But, so, and then there are, nowadays, there are even other methods that are even better, but in general, uh, this is a good background. First, you actually need to think about a bit of scoring. So you, you can, if you have an alignment of, so this is one position here, maybe. In this case, it's five alignments, five sequences. You can take a center sequence here, and you take the score is all the mutations of this one, or you can actually take all pairs. This is the optimal thing. So you can have all the pairs here, and you can take a substitution scores. You might all this, all the same. You can do that, or you can take some kind of hierarchical tree. So basically, say that. You only score the ones that are, that are most close to each other. So you do this kind of decision for the tree, how they're related. And of course, depending on how you do scoring, you get a slight, slight different results. If you have, well, this is the more accurate, most accurate thing to do, but it doesn't mean that you always get better alignment, because it really depends. For instance, if you have many sequences that are very similar to each other, you maybe don't want, don't want them to have the same weight. Because if you say that C, E, and F are 99.9% .9 identical, you're going to have everything that's going to be very high scores for. And you're going to have every B, C mutation is going to get three times higher weight than the B, D mutation, because it's just it's going to be the same every time. But the basic idea how often these methods work is basically that you 
Tänk, så det är inte deras skåring, det är deras lilla Matthews som har gjort. Men det är Matthews som har gjort. Du kan göra scoring any way you want. And But you have basically an idea that often you have start with so this is how class of W and most most battles have this somewhere in the background. So you assume you have five sequences here. So you start doing a pairwise comparison of all the sequences, so you do five by five or five by two. So you all do all these uh, ten comparisons. So every pattern. And you can tell which sequences are most similar to each other. So in this case, the blue and the red were most similar to each other. And the next, second most similar pattern was, was the green and the purple. So then you start aligning the blue and the red and making like a common average sequence or profile that that's called. So basically you put a, you make a Blue red sequence, and then you find okay, then you take that one and compare it to all the others also, and then you see that the green and the purple most similar to <coughs> align these together. <coughs> well, this is over here actually, but then the, the second step you take this one too, and take the next one is more similar to that one, which is this. So you have three alignments here, so you, but then you don't change anything between the blue and red ones. So you assume that these two are all aligned, and you have to add one more to it. There's no guarantee that this is the optimal alignment because you still could maybe be, have a better alignment if you actually made a small change here that compensated another change here. But because these two, the blue and red, were the ones that were most similar to start with, they were the ones that uh, are most likely to be, I mean, to have less gaps as well. So it's, it's a good assumption. And then you take, you have these three. And then you take these two here, they're aligned independently, and you put them together, these three aligned to these two. So this is exactly how basically how cluster W is doing. So it's, you start taking the sequence here, it does some clustering, and makes it what's called a guide tree. So basically have, we talk more, more about this next week also, we talk about phylogeny. So basically you make a tree that measure the distances from each other, see which, which ones are most close to, to each other, and you try to make a tree that kind of represent the similarity of all this. And uh, so you have this, this is two sequences of standard dynamic programming, standard sequence alignment, so nothing different from any other, other features. And then by aligning a pair of sequences to one or more, another pair of sequences, it's actually also the same thing. Because so you basically what you do is assume that you should just add in one sequence, so these two, so basically, I go to my standard matrix, and I have a new sequence here, sequence, and then here I have sequence, and I have maybe another one, sec, sec, I can just take a score here, and I do this, that this is a score of S aligned to two different S's. Yes, right. So this is two times the score of S. S, S substitution. Here I have two S, E, and S, T. And I have S, K, and S, Q. Here I have to do something with gaps. I have S, U, and S, gap. I just have to decide how I want to deal with the gaps. But basically, this is just the standard dynamic programming. I can do the same thing as I do with Sorbis. The only difference is that I have a slightly different scoring function. It looks like you don't believe me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the gap things are, I mean, the gaps are the problems. So of course, of course, I need to decide what I put in here. In particular, what I probably want to do is I want to put, put more gaps in the same place. But there are a lot of small details you have if you want to do this optimal. You, you don't want to end up with millions of different gaps all over. You want to have the gaps focus on one place. That's often what you do. And it's not obvious how to score it either. But so for instance, how do you score a gap like this? Here. So you have already 
you have six, there are these alignments here, these four sequences, and you want to align one more. And it's quite obvious that the ACD EFGH should align to this part here, so you want to put a gap here. But does the score as a gap opening in this sequence, or a gap extension here, or in these ones? So how do you score it? Is it, is it, a, is it a new gap, or is it just a gap to make it longer? And uh, uh, so this is what you have to do. So one of the tricks that Clutter W is doing is actually that it has a gap opening penalty that, that varies depending on how many other gaps you have in the, in the area. So the gap opening penalty is high here when there are no gaps, and in the region here where there are gaps, <coughs> in some of these alignments, it's lower. So the next alignment you, you obtain is going to put it, be more likely to put the gaps to close to other gaps, which is probably what you want to have. Which is probably what you. I mean, you you, you don't want to, to. I mean, it's more likely than that probably represent your your true alignment. So, I mean, if you have these two sequences here, and you first you want to add the top one here, and you don't want to add this gap a few steps here and there, you want to add it in the same place. I see if, if there are no gaps, so, and you see this some variation here because also it probably depends on how conserved the position is. No, I think that's another parameter optimized. But in particular, actually, it increase the gap, open the parameter close to the gaps, but as the gap is going to be lower. So this this is nothing that tells you this is going to be optimal alignment. This is a trick to be good. So that so this is this is. Very rough description, but it's not it's not that hard to understand. You basically can build up things like that. So what can you and there are other methods that are nowadays better, maybe my class W is a bit old a bit slow, the fa there's also been a of compromise between slow methods and faster methods. And uh, but uh, and put this new version of W called class, class omega, which is one of the better ones. And particular problem with this is that they are they work quite okay for four, five, six sequences. But nowadays you have 10,000 sequences in the families, which is just much sequence data. And often you end up with things that really look like... Uh, that looks like... So basically you have... I mean, if, if, if each of these maybe is 100 amino acids long, the whole alignment can maybe be maybe 10,000 um, positions long. So really you have gaps everywhere, you have something aligned here and there. Because it's just, the way it's just, you obtain more and more things. And it's not, it has something that maybe is wrong in the sequence that way, whatever. It, it, it can become very bad things. So you, in general, for very, very big families, first will take a long time, and secondly, it's not that rare that you end up with something which is completely crap. So th this comes to the point, it's like, what do we know, what, what, what can we use this alignment for, and how can we see if they're good, and what can we learn from them? So if we have a multi six alignment, what is, what is it that we can, how do we know if it's correct, and how, how, what can we learn from it? So there are a number of methods that actually visualize these uh, multiple six, six alignments. In particular, you can call them in good things. So like, quick, easy thing to actually see is like, as I said before, a good multiple six alignment often looks good. So these are two alignments. And they're colored in such a way that um, the amino acid type, depending on if polar or small, I'm sorry if you don't call it different way. So you can see in this alignment here, Um, wait a second. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so uh, this uh, alignments here are, uh, you see that there are lines here that are conserved with the same color. You can't really see what the, what the I mean as is there, but if I look close to it, I can see that this is an aspargine, or okay. this is a problem here at least. And this here is uh, all hydrophobic amino acids. So you see that there are columns of similar types of amino acids. It's not all of it, but it does, it does some patches at least. 
And you can see here that our scores here that it's conservation, there are some scores that are conserved. Quality, I guess, is just another measure, and consensus is like what is the consensus sequence and how much does it represent. In the context of this alignment here, you see that the gaps are a little bit here and there, there are gaps here and here and here and here and here. The other one has a few gaps here and a few ga and a lot of gaps in one, one position there. And you see the score of this conservation is just one part of conserved, nothing else, and the consensus is not very specific, one part here and there's much more variation. And you see there are very few, except for this area here, there are very few of these kind of nice patches here. Here you can see very things are shifted once there, because there's a glycine there and a glycine there. So just by looking at it, you can almost see uh, that one alignment is better than another one. So yeah, you know, this, uh, it seems like this may be okay if you would divide into three parts, like maybe this part up here is good, and this part here is good, and this part here is good, because they look a bit more similar. So maybe it should be, or maybe it's just that you could have fixed alignment by having gaps in the different positions. And you can actually learn a lot of things from this alignment. So yeah, if you have experience, you can learn a lot about the protein family and the different positions of this family. So what can you learn? Well, for instance, if you have glycines that are conserved, see, I guess you have some. Uh, is this glycine here? I guess it's conserved. And if you have a proton here, close it. That's that's a big term. So in my position, glycines and protons are very much common terms. So conserved proton and glycine often is some kind of term. You can see that this region here has much more gaps. But you can, if you have, for instance, color it by uh, hydrophobicity, so if you have hydrophobic patterns, that every second residue is hydrophobic. So here you have uh, valine, threonine, isoleucine, threonine, valine here. That suggests that it's a beta sheet. Because in a beta sheet, and you also, even though it's a beta sheet that's on the surface of a proton, of course, beta sheets has, I'll talk about structures yet, but we'll talk about later. You have, uh, beta sheets have, uh, well, every second rest will face one direction, every second rest will face the other direction. So, of course, if it's on the surface, the part that's facing the inside should be hydrophobic, and the part that faces the water, or surrounding solution, should be hydrophilic. We'll talk more about this, this actually, I think, next lecture, which might be, why not my next Monday? We'll talk about secondary structure prediction. And uh, if you have, instead of if you have a short run of four or five hydrophobic residues, that is actually beta strand that is buried, which is all faces other protein residues. And uh, uh, so. On the other hand, if you have I a separation of third residue or third fourth residue, it's hydrophobic or polar. That's the residue is alpha helix. So alpha helix goes round, and every 3.6 residues face the same direction. So here you have residue 3, 6, 7, 9, 10, and 13 are all hydrophobic. So that's the residue alpha helix. Cysteines conserved, if you find parasite cysteines are conserved. Uh, I guess you have some cysteine as well. That's just the disulfide bonds. If you have them, you can know that these are most likely close to each other. I mean, non uh, conserved cysteines, I guess, like that. Uh, oh, sorry, it was next slide, which didn't switch. So now, yeah, the cysteines that you don't really see, but they should be some cysteines somewhere. And there also, sh well, it should be some system somewhere. And the short rest, which is the red and blue ones here, often polar, and some of them are uh, mighty important, like active sites. And his history is often active sites. So, and pretty good things, so basically, things that are conserved, that is, all the human families are, of course, important for some reason. Because mutations happen randomly in the sequence, but if they destroy the function, they are not, not going to survive selection. So, if they are conserved, that means that they are functionally important. And functionally important often means one of the two things. Either they are functionally important for the structure of the protein, so basically they are important for 
having uh, been folding the right way, or the function is important for some kind of uh, uh, functional, like an, a catalytic site or a binding site or something like that. So they are often mixed with these two things. So what you can do is you can basically color it in different ways. You can and then the head slot. So this is the same alignment, but you color it by hydrophobic polar, and you can see it's a pattern. You can color it how uh, basically how, how light is to be buried or, or on a surface, which is basically more or less the same thing. You can call it beta strand light loads. So you see that you have region here that are maybe buried that are high. That, no, there are, what, this region here is highly to be a beta strand. Let's see, it is high amino acids back to be beta strands. And you see also that this is buried, so this is in that case a buried beta strand. Or the same thing, helical probabilities, you see that you have maybe a region here which is high helical probability, and you can see some patterns here of every third for residues that are hydrophobic, so that could be indicated as a helix. So there's a lot of things you can learn from, from an, an alignment. So another way to call it is what you call it the conservation, so basically you call it, uh, well, this is still amino, amino acid types, so you can find the conserved important residues, so you have a glycine here. And here is a set of charged uh, isolutes and then the charged residues around it. So this can end, indicate maybe some binding size. So two, I mean, two that say sequence is this leucine isolution is the paper program for some reason. Hmm. So you see, but yeah, conservation, well. Uh, rest of properties. So often you see the conserved rest, you see that like it's here, uh, what is conserved, is it this rest here? They, they call it another way of what, what, what types they are. So this problem is here, very conserved, uh, so that's something important. Okay, so this is, of course, you can look at it, but it, it's, um, it takes some experience, and you have to think about it, but you can get things from alignment. But, Honestly, in most cases, computers are much better, I guess, than we are. At least, unless you're really, really a special expert. So we can use these properties from these alignments and put them into a computer program that recognizes these different features. So this is actually what I'll not talk about today, but we'll talk about next week. But you can please use this pretty secondary structure. So you see these patterns of every third rest will be in helix, or some amino acids that like to be in helix. You could guess that it's an alpha helix. That secondary structure prediction. But that's for next week. At the moment, we will instead use them to detect more homologs. So, this is a bit confusing terms here, and I kind of mix them. Sometimes it's called profile, sometimes it's called position specific scoring matrix. And actually, in nowadays, people most if you use it, it's what they say, hit a mod model, which is not exactly the same thing, but it's very related. Uh, so, profile of PSM is kind of as are uh, exchangeable terms. And uh, uh, So the idea is basically, as I said, as the PSSM says, is that you have position-specific scoring matrix. So scoring matrix was of course the, the, the matrix that calculated what is the cost to replace an alanine with the triple fan. So here, if I go back to my matrix here, I have a position-specific scoring matrix. So I have my query sequence here. And I have my PSSM up here, which so basically is a multiple sequence alignment or calculating that. So that means that even if you have an uh, alanine in the main sequence or the position, I can get different scores than alanine here for, for a Q to A alignment here and here and here, because they're position specific. So basically, I calculate. What I want to do, the, the scoring matrix should calculate the probability of replacing one amino acid with another one. So in the position specific one, what I do is I, to, I calculate the probability of aligning one particular amino acid in that position. 
So basically, I take the multiple six alignment and ask how common is it to find a Q here? Or here. In, in, in short times, and that's the and I think logarithmic probability. So, uh, so basically, if I have this, if I have, if I have this table, I can, there are some statistical measures that you get, and you can put different weights on different things. There are a lot of you can optimize them in different ways, and also do the gap penalties are different. So if I if, the, if I have alignment here with many gaps. Maybe I want to have a different gap cost, exactly as we did when we did the uh, cluster W alignment. But then if I have this, I can do my alignment exactly as I do with, uh, no, with normal dynamic programming. It's just that I have a different score here. Do you believe me? And do you think it could be useful? Well, it, it's basically because this of all contains more information. So I have, if I know that it has conserved alanine here, for example, so I have one position here that's going to go all arginine. So I know it has been arginine in this position. For the score of aligning this arginine to this one, it's going to be very high. It's going to be plus some very, very big number. Maybe not that big. But if I have a position here where I have a uh, lot of different amino acids that score here, it's basically going to be zero for everything. It doesn't matter what I put there, because it's equally likely to have anything there. And uh, if I have a score that has isolucine and solutions, if I have an isolucine here, it doesn't matter, I have a vegan here, then basically maybe any uh, hydrophobic amino acid fits quite well there. So the idea is basically I can do this. I can take my sequence. Right, now I turn it around these plots, and I have the multiple alignments. I have my profile here, and I can find an alignment exactly as I did before. There are some history there. For the easy thing is just uh, the method from Gibbs Cobb et al. in 1987. I just take the average. Basically, you have you basically take uh, scores just. If I have an alanine here, or if I have three alanines here, I just take one third of the alanine cost. To, well, I take the alanine cost. If I have one alanine, one alanine, and one lysine, I take one third of the cost of each of the substitutions. So something like that. So I want to calculate the score of putting an A in column one here. So here I have one, two, three, four, five valines, one for alanine and one isolution. So then the score is just the valine uh, A substitution times five sevens and one seventh of the phenylalanine score and one seventh of the isolation score. So that's a very simple thing. Uh, so this is the, and here S, the score is just a standard pan blossom matrix. So that, that's, it works quite well, but it's not, maybe not ideal. So, in this case, I will have 50 and then, well, I have this course, you have to take pen to 50 matrix, has these numbers for them, I add them together like that. It's just very simple. Then you can add, maybe calculate ga gap. So here you can use, if, if I have all the gaps in the column, I probably want to have a lower gap penalty. So I can just calculate the factor of gaps and multiply the gap penalty with some factor. So they, they, they optimize a few things there. But this is a problem. For instance, you actually get the same score for having a cysteine here and a, and a cysteine like that. So in one sequence, so the score, the search score is the same. And of course, conserved system in all the sequences is much more important. Uh, and you also have similar score for gaps. So what, uh, if you want to delete one, uh, if you want to have a gap here, or here, it basically will have the same score. Because here you have one gap, but here you have actually all gaps. But you both have a position to delete one. 
So, so it would actually be much, but here it seems much light, more likely to have a gap than you would have in this position here. Hmm. So you can you can modif modify this by using the mean atom frequencies and have higher scoring functions for that. And uh, so you have the um, uh, you just calculate how many I mean as you find in each position. And you take a frequency of this and you multiply this with all the substitution matrices and you get a new, new score. And then you can take the log of this and that is basically the new scoring function. So you got uh, your Q from. Mm. So basically, here you get a score that is made that if the position is higher. Uh, uh, Q is equality, but they have conserved position. So you have a higher, and Q is PA. What? So you get a higher score for more conserved position. <coughs> so let's continue after a break with Cyblast, which is actually the, the algorithm that is using all of this information, and actually it was it was it's almost 20 years old, but it's really made a huge difference to the to the uh, field, and I will also give some examples actually that shows you how well it works. Mm -hmm.